our next speaker um, uh, is, is going to help, hopefully, and we have a minute of IT work here as he needs his own computer. Uh, one of the most critical things an entrepreneur does is sell, sell to employees, sell to customers, and raise money selling to investors. I find it's the one place where entrepreneurs could do much, much better quite easily. So hopefully he'll teach us a few lessons on how to present to win. Jerry? He's been a presentation coach forever. In the 90s, we used to use Jerry to IPO train every CEO before they went on an IPO roadshow at my former firm, Kleiner Perkins, and we've, we've kept up a relationship. So as soon as the IT is done, Jerry, all yours. The, de the demo god struck. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Good to meet all of you again from yesterday. Four diverse people from four diverse, very diverse fields of study, from four diverse time frames, from four diverse walks of life, share something in common. One of them is a Nobel laureate and economist. Another is a professor of Gestalt psychology. Another is a best-selling author, and the fourth is a journalist. What they all share is that they are role models of Vinod's podcast. They are instigators of change. Each of them, in their own way, in their own field, have looked at legacy practices and instigated change, change for the better, change that changed the way things were done in their fields. Daniel Kahneman is the Nobel laureate. His book, Thinking Fast and Slow, came out 10 years ago and became an instant bestseller. Rudolf Arnheim, a professor at Sarah Lawrence and at Harvard, 70 years ago wrote a book called Art and Visual Perception which became the Bible of cinema studies. 50 years ago, Timothy Galway wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis, removing it from the outer game of tennis. And three years ago, Kate Murphy, a journalist who has been successfully published in many publications, wrote a best-selling book called You're Not Listening. Each of those books created change in their field. They changed me. I'm a presentation coach, and I help people present to win. My methodology grew out of my background before I became a presentation coach as a producer and director of public affairs and news programs at CBS. But what they taught me was to change. As a matter of fact, I've written three books about these subjects, about how to present to win, to tell a crisp, clean, and compelling story, to design slides that illustrate the story simply and effectively, to present with poise, assurance, and confidence, and to handle the tough questions when they come down the pike. I've written books about these subjects, which you'll all get, Presenting to win is about the art of telling your story and designing your slides. The power presenter is how to present with poise and confidence and assurance. And in the line of fire is how to handle tough questions. But people can't learn to present by reading books. So we at Suasive have created a four session program that illustrates these with a broad array of techniques and best practices, many of them drawn by the instigators from change. But you can't learn from a lecture. You have to have the depth of application. These four skills apply to any presentation you'll ever give, an IPO roadshow, an all-hands meeting, pitching a customer, 
pitching a board, even not for profit. All those factors must optimize. And we're going to show you how today to optimize them, but we only have time for 30 minutes, so I'm going to give you one practice from each of these. Before I do, however, a very important note about these four essential elements. They cannot be unbundled. They have to work together. For instance, a presenter can tell a crisp, clean, compelling story and then ruin it by what is known as death by PowerPoint. You're, you're smiling. You've been there before. Slide. The story fails. Slide. <laughs> Slideware. So suppose you're Nicole Kynes and you have a great microbiology therapeutic and you come out and the slide deck looks like Grey's Anatomy and the Encyclopedia Britannica on every frame. The story fails. Suppose instead you tell a crisp, clean, and compelling story, and then use slides the way we designed them at CBS, not the way CNN does them, where the breaking news and the stock prices appear on every screen with the moderator. The story succeeds. Suppose the presenter tells a crisp, clean, and compelling story and then uses CBS-style slides but stands up and is smitten by the deer-in-the-headlight syndrome. The story fails. Suppose a presenter tells a crisp, clean, and compelling story, has CBS-style slides, has the charm, the ease, and the grace of a Ronald Reagan, and holds the audience spellbound for the entire length of the presentation, and for the first time in the recorded history of presentations, nobody interrupts. The presentation goes smoothly, you open the floor to questions, and if the first question is a zinger and the presenter doesn't handle it effectively, the story fails. So you have to address all these skills. So let's proceed with one instigator of change per book, per, per element beginning with Dr. Kahneman. Fast thinking is what the mind does when it comes upon a new event, a new person, a new idea, a new page, a new slide, a new subject. Fast thinking, the ideas bubble up rapidly, randomly, with biases, with preconceptions, with generalities, a mess. A man named John Mnugian III, the third, a self-proclaimed internet nerd, created what he called the Cognitive Bias Codex to demonstrate how many thoughts go into the mind. Don't try to read it. That's what's going on. That's fast thinking. When people do presentations, they start by shuffling the slides into a sequential order. Shuffling the slides into a sequential order is slow thinking. System two. So if you to, were to start shuffling your slides or seeking order when system one is bubbling around, the two systems clash and result in fragmentation. Fragmentation loses audiences. Lost audiences lose deals. So what do you do? You have to separate system one from system two. Here's how it works. You start thinking of an idea and they begin bubbling up randomly. Let them happen. Let system one get out of its way. Let system one run its course. That's called brainstorming. And you can brainstorm all you want up in your mind, but you can't do anything with it, so you have to get it out of your mind and onto an external surface. You can put it on Post-its. You can put it on a digital whiteboard. You can one, use one of a dozen or so software programs to brainstorm. You can use yellow legal pads. At CBS, 30 years ago, we had no post-its, they hadn't been invented. We had no digital whiteboards. What we had was three by five index cards, push pins, and cork boards. And we put our ideas up on a wall randomly. We let it happen. Before we 
expose the frame of film. Before we recorded a decibel of sound, we let it happen before we structured the presentation, the program. You need to do that too, let it happen. Only when it's run its course are you ready for system two. System two then begins to organize. The first step in organizing is to find relationships. As the relationships form, they distill into clusters, four, five, six clusters, that's all, which represent the entire story. You group your ideas. And then and only then are you ready for sequence. Not until then. But now with only six elements, or five elements, or three elements to sequence, which goes first, which goes second, and which goes last. So the key takeaway here is do the data dump in your preparation and not your presentation. Don't try to tell the story until you consider all the ideas. The takeaway from Dr. Kahneman is focus before flow. Stay away from the deck. Stay with the ideas. Stay with the concepts, stay with the context. On to Rudolf Arnheim. Professor Arnheim, who taught at Sarah Lawrence and at Harvard, was a gestalt, gestalt psychologist. For Dr. Arnheim, you can't consider the elements until you consider the whole. For him, the elements of art and visual perception are the art, and the perception, the creation, and the viewer. In presentations, the slide, and the audience. So how do audiences perceive your slides? All human eyes, and therefore brains, perceive images driven by two powerful and yet contradictory forces. Nature is what we've learned to do, and nurture is what we do involuntarily, reflexively, neurologically. In Western culture, we've learned to read from left to right. So every time there's a new image, we start at the left. This fact goes all the way back to the medieval period, when the monks wrote scrolls and illuminated the first letter. It means start here. So your audiences do that. They start there. Then nature takes over. Nature says, uh-oh, there's more information on the screen. There are light emittances. Let me go get them. So the eye then traverses the screen or the page or the scroll, and sees everything. Painters understand this better than anybody else. They know that their paintings will be viewed by starting at the left and moving to the right. That's why most painters sign their paintings in the lower right-hand corner of the canvas. Website designers understand this. They use eye-tracking software to see where the best real estate on the screen is. So in presentations, when you present, know that your audience will start at the left and go to the right, just two moves. Of course, if you're presenting to Vinod, he wants another left to right kind of move. Hockey stick of growth, right, Vinod? <laughs> two moves. In those two moves, your audience should be able to get your slide at a glance, think of every slide, every slide in every deck you do as a billboard. Billboard designers do not expect their audience, people in moving cars, to stop the car and read the billboard. Do not expect your audience to stop and read your slide while you're jabbering away because they're not gonna be able to do both. It's two inputs that clash. They can't do both. If they read the slide, and by the way, reading the slide, the reflex action of the eye, is more powerful than the ear. 
So they're going to stop listening to you. So those of you who have to put everything on the deck to show how smart you are and how thorough you are are driving your audience away. You cannot do that. Make sure they get it at a glance. If you put additional information, the audience will have to take another sweep and another sweep and another sweep and keep sweeping until they're overloaded and stop listening to you. So the simple solution, minimize the eye sweeps. Don't make your audience have to go back and forth across the screen. A little experiment for everybody in the audience. I'm going to show two slides. On the first slide, feel your eyes having to move twice to take in the information. Now feel your eyes move once to take in the information. So how do you minimize eye sweeps? Well, there are lots of slides and lots of options. We have only time for one, which is text. In text, the simple solution is to use headlines and not sentences. A lot of people here who come from McKinsey, and McKinsey tells people to make the deck tell the story. The deck doesn't tell the story, you tell the story. And if you put the sentence up on the screen to tell the story, the audience spends their time reading the sentence. Today's Wall Street Journal. One headline, Biden pledges Taiwan military defense. A, a headline, not a sentence. Broadcom offers 60 billion as it pushes to buy VMware. Not a grammatical sentence. So in, in constructing your slides, particularly with text, we're not gonna talk about numbers, we're not gonna talk about images, we're not gonna talk about tables today, we don't have time. But in constructing your slides, make them headlines. Avoid articles, conjunctions, prepositions, and helping verbs. Stick to nouns and verbs and the occasional adjectives. Minimize eye sweeps from Rudolf Arnheim. Moving now to Timothy Galway. Timothy Galway looked at the way tennis was taught, the outer game, grip, hand, knee, shoulder, feet, eyes, body, shoulder, address. All of that in a tennis lesson makes the tennis student self-conscious. They're thinking of everything they have to do. Self-consciousness destroys concentration. Concentration wins in athletics. Concentration wins in presentations. So we've adapted Galway's method, and we call it the mental method. And we're going to show you this for both in-person and virtual. Here's the way it works. You step up to the front of the room, and what happens? You say to yourself, yikes, they're all looking at me. I'd better do well. I want to get this deal. I want to close it. I want a term sheet. I want to get the buy. That's all about you. It's all about you, internal. What we suggest you do is what Timothy Galway suggests, concentrate outside of you. He suggests you concentrate on the ball and the flight of the ball. Concentrate on your audience. Concentrate on your audience one person at a time. So pick a person and start speaking to that person. When you speak to that person, don't just throw information at that person. Read the reaction. See where the ball lands. Then, depending upon what you see, adjust the content. I look at Samir, and he's frowning at me. That means he doesn't quite understand what I'm saying. So I adjust my content. I say, Samir, what I mean by that is, and then Samir starts ah. nodding at me. He gives me a big fat aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I've adjusted my content. I haven't changed the entire 
it's not an encyclopedic change, it's just a bit more. What I mean by that, Samir, is, or what that stands for, or for example, Samir, that adjustment takes you out of yourself and connects you with Samir. I look at another person, and I read that person's reaction, and like Samir, they get it the first time. Now I adjust my content, I move on, I address less information. Again, it's not a matter of a big, accord, a big accordion, it's just small adjustments of the content. It takes you out of yourself, out of your self-consciousness, out of your will I succeed, out of the yikes moment, and into the audience, and where the ball lands. In virtual, this becomes even more important because in virtual, the human interaction has been converted from a 3D environment with stereophonic sound to a 2D environment, postage stamp size, monaural sound, one at a time. That depletion of the connection between the presenter and the audience is devastating, or can be devastating, unless you close the gap. The way to close the gap is the same way as an in-person. Pick a person, start talking to that person, read the reaction, and depending upon what you see that person's face do, because all you're gonna get is the face, adjust the content a little bit more, a little bit less. Go to another person, read the reaction, adjust the content. Move around your gallery, uh, reading the reaction, adjusting the content, reading the reaction, adjusting the content. So the big takeaway from Timothy Galway is don't stay inside, get outside, read the reaction of the audience. And now to Kate Murphy. The first paragraph in Kate Murphy's book reads this way. What was the last time you ever had somebody talk to somebody and you really felt they listened? You really felt understood? I began our sessions with people learning to answer questions or field questions by asking a simple question. I say, is there a man or woman alive who either hasn't accused or been accused by their significant other of not listening? Why are you all smiling? <laughs> not listening is the issue here. So people in search of my skills as a coach say, can you help us field tough questions? What are they, well, what, how do we do this? Can you show us how to answer the questions effectively? Can you show us how to spin? Can you show us how to position? Can you show us how to tie back? Before I can do anything like that, I need to show them how to listen. I need to show people how to listen. So let's go back into how people listen. When most people prepare for their Q&A sessions, they sit down and they make a list of questions. And then they make a list of answers. Small problem. People don't ask questions as written on the list or on the to list. So the poor presenter is forced to figure out which part of the question goes with which part of the answer because of that randomized thinking. There's Professor Kahneman's fast thinking again. A perfect illustration of this is this. I coach a number of uh, CEOs on their quarterly earnings calls, and I listen to the earnings calls, and I listen to analysts asking questions of the CEO and the CFO. Now think about this. Analysts who ask questions follow the company. They follow the company daily. They live, breathe, eat, sleep, drink, dream the company. They know the subject. Take a listen to one of those earnings calls and you'll hear analysts ask long rambling questions. Why? Because they're doing system one, even though they know the subject. Now imagine what it's like if someone is hearing your subject for the first time. The questions will come out rambling. And you're stuck with trying to figure out what the answer. But what it sounds to you is Greek. 
But most people, when they're preparing or when they're listening to the question, being results driven, think of the answer. Well, if you think of the answer while the rambling question is being asked, you might as well be wearing earplugs because you're thinking about the wrong thing. So instead of thinking of the answer, listen for that ramble, stay with the ramble, dig the key issue out of the ramble, the one, two, three words that identify what they're asking you. Do not think of the answer. It's useless. It's counterproductive. Listen for the key issue. Now, to help you do that, a simple technique, so simple, it's, it's almost ridiculous. The technique is called subvocalization. Subvocalization means without moving your throat, without moving your lips, say to yourself, they want to know how I compete. Oh, they want to know my path to profitability. They want to know how we can fix that problem. You hear that? Once you say problem, compete, path to profitability, then your mind is teeing up the answer, but you're not answering yet. You're focusing on the subject. Subvocalize the question and not the answer. That's Kate's big takeaway. Listen, listen, listen. It's a pervasive problem in interpersonal relationships. It's death of the deal in business if you don't listen, if you don't answer the question. One technique from each of these four elements will help you present to win. If you want more, they're in the books, which you'll all get. I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you. You're sending your deck to somebody who has to interpret those slides themselves. And, and a lot of times these are very technical conversations, right? So any advice there? Yes, I do have advice. Drive the wedge between the deck and the handout. Drive the wedge. When you send the deck ahead, you're making what's called a twofer. A twofer means you're using a display mechanism as a document. There's a difference between a display mechanism and a document. Got you. Can you, can you read what I've told you in the last 20 minutes? Yeah. Can you read it? Can you tell what I said? In the last 20 minutes? If I hand you this deck, could you remember what I said? Oh, for the most part. But you didn't read it on the screen. Right. The biggest shortfall in business today is the concept of the deck that the deck is used for a handout, a send ahead, a leave behind, look smart, be smart, be sharp. We go back to Rudolf Arnheim, the Gestalt. When you put the deck up on the screen, they stop listening to you. Nobody is gonna make a deal on the basis of the deck, are they? Can you send the deck ahead and, and get a deal, a term sheet? No way. When companies go public, they are required to record their roadshow and post it on Net Roadshow. So the entire presentation, sometimes produced at the cost of a quarter of a million dollars, goes up for any investor to see. Will anybody make an investment based on that video? No. Will they make a, an investment based on a deck? No. They're going to make an investment based on pressing the flesh of the CEO, asking the questions, understanding it. If you, you all, I've, I've read your backgrounds. I've met a lot of you over the last day and a half here. You all have wonderful backgrounds, wonderful companies. You're trying hard to make your company work. You are the investment. You are the, the story. 
tell the story. Don't expect an inanimate deck to tell your story. Vinod's been very kind to me over the years and sent me a lot of people, and they say, but Vinod wants us to send the deck. Well, not Vinod. Vinod's learned well enough that you don't make the deal on the deck. Vinod's great saying is, message sent is not always message received. You have to send the message and make sure it lands. The deck doesn't tell the story, you tell the story. So the way to solve it is the wedge can be done by having one deck to present and one deck to send ahead. Or send ahead the notes page view. But what you present when you, what you project when you present is only the slide deck. Thank you for that question that is so central to every business concept, every presentation concept. Next question. One time for more, Sebastian. Uh, my question is kind of the opposite. You've been making this case that don't uh, lean uh, on the speak deck. Speak up. Yeah, my question is the opposite. So you've been making this case, don't lean on the deck. Can you tell us why is the deck even there? What is the deck trying to do? Couldn't you just tell the story with no deck? The reason the deck is there is because visual, again, this is another aspect of another scientist. Visual learning is more powerful than audio learning. So the visual reinforcement puts it into the mind. It, it serves as a headline. Take a look at CBS tonight. They're not CNN. CBS is doing what we did when I was there. They put headlines up on the screen, and the spokesman, the anchor person, gives the detail. CNN puts text on the screen. Bloomberg puts text on the screen. They, and while they're putting the text on the screen, they've got the screen crawl, and they've got the stock market, and they've got the headlines, and they've got the, and you don't know where to look. Now that's just you looking at one screen. When a presenter is standing next to the screen, too much, too much information. It's like crossing the audio and video cables on the TV set. It produces static and snow. So use the deck for visual reinforcement. Billboards, billboards, billboards. Minimize eye sweeps. One more, somebody? We better get to lunch. Okay. I want to thank Jerry. Be before you do, a plug for this afternoon. For those of you who'd like to, come to the workshop called How to Make a No Second Chance for a First Impression. I'm going to teach you how to do the first 90 seconds of the presentation. We'll take volunteers, and I'll coach you. I 